Good day folks, I'd like to show you a method to create RF without using a traditional transmitter as we're used to. And I call this the displacement inductive no transmission communication method. And basically the way this works is we use a galvanatic cell here. It's a low level DC voltage, so in the example I use the potato battery here. So you've got your plus and your negative here. So the plus going all the way here into the L1 coil here, going down into a coupling transformer, which is our modulation transformer for audio input. So what happens is this will modulate our loop here. And this is the L2 that couples into the L1, and this is where the RF comes out in our, basically this would be the L3 loop. Now, just take a look at this for a moment, folks, and you'll probably go, this guy is going quackers, you know. You're probably laughing at this right now because you're thinking this guy really doesn't know electronics because what he's suggesting here is a, is a dead short. Look at it. Plus, loop, loop, it's all the same. So you're shorting out the potato. He's not going to get RF with that. Wait, folks, let me explain. In a galvanetic cell, we do have a low level DC, but there's also another form of electricity here. We have a low level AC as well. Because what happens is, between the two dissimilar metals, we'll create an AC frequency that will float atop of the DC. Now, this becomes our source of AC that we're now able to modulate and convert into an RF field by using displacement inductive methods. So now all of a sudden, our loop antenna has a few milliwatts of output and the frequency will be very, very, and depending on the setup here, but it could be anywhere from 10 to 60 hertz, no problem. And you will have your modulation right here. Now, what's the second problem, folks? You're probably noticing something right away. You're probably thinking, okay, he covered himself there, but he's still quackers because Look at his frequency, 10 to 60 hertz. The guy doesn't have the bandwidth to modulate voice through that. Wait. Since we're using displacement inductive method, we're biasing with a DC voltage as well. And it's thanks to the modulation which does the displacement of this static DC that we're able to superimpose Another way of looking at it is this hidden information in the carrier wave, which is, in this case, the low-level AC that comes from the potato. We modulate that, we create a field, and we get an RF, folks, without using any... Of course, basically, this is what um, Stumblefield was doing, but instead of the earth potato, he used the earth battery, which gave him the same effect, but instead he tapped into the earth's Schumann resonance instead by using the Earth's ground and the loop antenna nearby helped him to create a sort of phase loop lock, PLL, which allowed him to stabilize the system with, by using the Earth's Schumann resonance as the carrier. He was able to superimpose his modulated information and somebody close by that had the identical setup and was able to bias the same way was able to then decode the information. Now this is a very great unique way of communicating folks because we're no longer limited by the bandwidth of the carrier wave and we can still have a wide band uh, information because we're depending on the displacement as our source of information. So next I'm going to take it another step and show you how this could be fine-tuned and used today for our practical radio applications instead, so stay tuned. Alright folks, this is a term I came up with because I couldn't find anything that was relevant, so I guess correct me if I'm wrong, so this is another mode of operation here I came up with, which I call IGCM, which stands for Inductive Guided Carrier Modulation. Now let me explain this mode if we want to take the previous concept but make it more practical for an actual communication system that we could use today and incorporate it with the radio technology we have. So here's a basic schematic of how that would work. Here would be a solid state modern high-powered PLL oscillator, any frequency we want, 
It could be 1 megahertz, it could be 100 megahertz, that doesn't really matter too much in this system. So what happens if you see here in the circuit, this, in, this is an inductive um, transformer. So what happens here, this gives us our AC in this loop here, which is our PLL. And what happens is we have our DC bias here, like previous, which goes into this loop here. And in this case here, it's more sold state, so we won't be using a potato battery anymore here. So you'll probably have an external power supply. The issue with that, as you know, is we're writing a dead short here, so you don't want to actually short out your DC power supply because things will get hot, the power supply will either, either break down or part of your circuitry here will melt. So this is not the kind of door, dead short ideally you would want to have. So we have a resistor here that helps us protect that so we don't suck all the current out of the power supply that we don't need for nothing. So 10K is just a rough value. Whatever you're going to use, you're going to have to calculate that and take the inductance of all your loops into consideration and the maximum current of your DC power supply and carefully choose your... Make sure the wattage, so if it's, you know, 100 milliwatts, don't use it a very cheap transistor, you know, more so like if it's a few watts, you know. So protection resistor is very crucial here, so that's what this is for. And uh, what happens is we have our DC bias here at a specified voltage. You'll want to experiment with whatever voltage you want. And here's our, our, our modulation input, which couples our audio, so we're allowed, so now we're using the displacement again to create that, but the difference here is we're not using the potato anymore for a source of AC, we're using a much more controlled way of doing it now. So this could be suitable for today's radio communication, and there's the loop antenna here which would be our output, which has a much more greater probably in the watts of output here. Now this method is really good folks because we're able to use our carrier frequency as the carrier, so it, it carries the information, but in a normal radio, you're not able to receive it unless you do the DC bias setup through the... So the receiver has to be built in a very similar way here, but obviously in reverse. So you would the audio input here would become your audio output, and obviously you wouldn't need the PLL stage because you already got the loop inducing the... as long as you're in range of the RF part, you DC bias the same way. Everything has to be identical because you need to, the resonance needs to be there. But you would get the output this way. So, so your RX and TX systems need to be slightly modified to make this work. But the upside of it is you can encode very wide bandwidths and very narrow frequencies like I said earlier. You could use if you, for some reason you want to use 20 hertz, you could use 20 hertz and, and use FM light bandwidth in and then use just the carrier. It's the displacement and the DC bias that is alongside with the carrier that allows us to extract this information back in the audio. So I hope you enjoy and take this concept very interestingly because it's a whole new way of working with radio which we could work with today and would open up the bandwidth for a lot of frequencies and it would allow us to communicate at much lower power levels because at narrow bandwidths we use a fraction of the wattage that's necessary to make communications. So can you imagine if we use extremely narrow band communications to be able to pipe in incredible amount of information, possibly even high speed digital data, in a very very narrow bandwidth. So the possibilities here become, again, another endless, and again, you know, this is Nathan Stumblefield, which in the background, in the roots of this, experimented with using the AC of the Earth's field to try and do this. I just took it one step further and figured, hey, we can do this artificially and much better by using the same methods and have a pretty darn good communication system in relative to what we have traditionally today. Now this is probably going to make you think and I'm going to show you an even a really interesting possibility which is even borderline I'm not even sure if I should tell you folks but for the purpose of transparency and education it's, it's stronger than me I have to show you the next thing and this is very interesting, so stay tuned.
All right, folks, here's the other method that I was a bit hesitant in sharing because once you understand how this potentially works, it opens the door to a lot of possibilities and potentially some dangerous ones or some that will maybe piss people off in the communications field. And I will explain to you why. So back to the IGCM, Inductive Guided Carrier Modulator Method. And um, basically, the modification here is we're no longer using a local oscillator. We're instead borrowing the 50,000 watt FM, 100 megahertz carrier signal, which has a range of about 50 miles. Here's the transmitter tower, which means we're, we're remote. Our receiver could be 10 miles, it could be 5 miles, as long as we're in range of the 50 thousand watt FM carrier and we can induce it with a loop and a circuit like this, a closed loop with a DC bias of course, that same DC bias, you got to pay attention to it. So what you're going to do with the audio input with the help of an audio amp, you're going to modulate with a modulation coil that's going to create displacement and because our loop is tuned to 100 megahertz with the 50 kilowatt FM station, we're going to be able to superimpose a small information within that as so we're basically using their carrier as a sort of waveguide and we're encoding a kind of way to hide our information and in using their carrier now what happens with this is we can have a receiver maybe 40 miles or 50 miles away as long as they receive this they've got the same setup here but instead of an audio in, it's audio out. So they're receiving the station, they're providing the same bias, this gives them the DC so they could have the displacement, so they have the inductive guided carrier, all of this working together, and they're able to decode thanks to the DC bias, the hidden information we embedded in the carrier. Now this is a very clever way of communicating because as you see we can borrow any transmitter we want, encode our own information into it, and if somebody remote knows the configuration of our loops and our DC bias and all of the configuration, they can receive us. And not only can we do that, is we can put any bandwidth we want in the encoded information and normal people who are listening to the regular 50 kilowatt what FM station won't even notice because they don't have this tuning mechanism in place. They don't have the DC bias so they can use the, the carrier wave to create a displacement here because they're missing the DC bias component. We only use the um, carrier as the waveguide in this example. So um, this probably answers the question going further here is um, some people may used to uh, have followed Bedini and he had this thing where he had these audio amps and people were amazed because he had everything going through one wire but he used a bit wacko terms like the signal is going into subspace and the wire is just used as a guide and then you'd have a sort of amp on the other side receiving that and he'd be able to use really really th thin cables at a hundred feet and have super quality on the other side and people were wondering how he was doing that well, because we're basing ourselves crudely with the Stumblefield method here, and Bedini followed Stumblefield a lot, and he researched the Stumblefield methods, and he probably ran across and came up with his own version and explanation to this phenomena here that happens, and used, incorporated this kind of circuit in his black box and was able to like our previous circuit here with a little small local oscillator and this kind of modulation was able to use a small wire here where the loop would go as you see I'm sure you're following me and this is how on the other side you have a similar receiver setup and this would fall in line to what Tom Bearden was saying when people would open up his amplifiers the first thing they'd go is this will never work in this configuration that's not how you wire but Taking this kind of setup in the configuration, yes, this is how you would wire it. So, at the same time, indirectly, I may have solved the Bedini mystery at the same time here. So, I hope you take this into good consideration. I have been building circuits like this. I'm experimenting with this myself. Very interesting stuff. This could be useful for the ham operators. This could have military applications. I'm sure they already know about it, but they're not wanting to tell us flat out. But this is very sound concepts, folks. So, food for thought, and we'll see you around, and I hope you enjoy. Thank you.